It's been a very short summer, but we're back with our podcast routine. And welcome to Christopher Blackburn, Jeremiah Hello. Wentz, hey. Tobin Doobie, Hello. and I'm Lee Bortons. And today we're talking on culture and influence. And our wonderful producer, Chris Blackburn, is, co- Blackburn is going to lead the way. Should get Blackburn my identity. <laughs> yeah, last time I was a pirate. <laughs> Um, yeah, so leading off of our, our last podcast, which has been a while, but I, I was thinking about the direction that the, the culture media loop goes. And does it, does it flow that we receive our culture from media or do we dictate to our media, you know, based on our culture, what we get? And so especially most recently, uh, I feel like every other post that I've seen on social media for a little bit there was someone saying, the Amazon rainforest is burning and no one's talking about it. And then I would flip and the next page would be, the Amazon rainforest is burning and why no one's talking about it. And the next person would say, did you know the Amazon rainforest is burning? And I went, okay, well, clearly we're all talking about it, but how long has it been burning? And why is it significantly so much worse now than it has been before? And uh, I was curious if you guys had looked into it at all and what you guys thought about it. So I have a question back for you though and why I introduced the topic. Um, Was it a new topic for you? It was. This past week? Yep. Okay. I hadn't researched anything about it until now. And are you aware of the uh, Bolsonaro politics that are yep. going on? Yep. And so, you know, how much of the articles related to um, just the whole policy of what is being called a right wing president? Yeah. Did you see an influence there? Or? It's funny because I keep seeing people posting that the Amazon rainforest is burning and in almost with the context of like the California fires where it's, you know, just it's on fire and it just happens to be on fire. But that's not a natural thing for rainforests to just catch on fire. Um, well, they're not so on fire. I mean, they're of, not catching on fire accidentally. Exactly. It's they're being, they're, yeah. being burned. And that happens to be a direct response to the deregulatory practices of Bolsonaro or so it seems. Um, but the people have been doing this for years now. If you look at the maps that you sent us for the links, um, the actual number of fires in what is Amazonas as a state is small compared to the southern areas where it's more populated and there's more people. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always I'm just curious about how much of it is the Amazon's burning versus maybe just suburbia Brazil is burning. I don't know enough. Right. And so. and so that's the thing is that, you know, that land um, around the people, because, you know, the Amazon rainforest is, is largely uninhabited, the actual bulk of the forest. But then, you know, it stretches out to all these other areas. So again, the like suburbia, the places where there are people living, it's it's not profitable land to just be forest if you can burn it down and then put, you know, crops on there or put, you know, a whole bunch of livestock on there. And so it's actually an interesting thought to me that I had this morning as I was driving over here thinking, if it's so significant to us to maintain the rainforest because we don't want all this carbon in the atmosphere, we want to have more oxygen, even though that's kind of a weird argument because I think a rainforest is oxygen neutral in terms of how much life is being created versus how much it's actually pulling carbon out of the air. Um, but if it's really that important, significant as a resource to everyone in the world that we want to lay claim on Brazil and tell them what to do with their forest, why aren't we paying them for their oxygen? That's interesting. <laughs> I feel like that conversation just went somewhere I wasn't expecting yeah. there. Uh, I'm going to proclaim my ignorance because I'm not on social media. So, And the feeds that I do get on and see, uh, most of my friends were, were like, hey, did you know Andrew Luck retired? What is this going to do to our fantasy team this year? So that's kind of <laughs> – so, I mean, this is the beauty and the and the negative thing about social media is – and it really adds online in general is they, they tailor around the stuff that you tend to look up online. And so I don't know what that says about me personally, but I will say that I'm just not on social media that much. And I don't know if the news uh, sources that I go to, have, they don't really seem like it's as big a deal as everyone on social media is making it. I mean, I go to news sites online and, you know, I see a lot of stuff about Hong Kong, mm. you know, but I don't yep. see, I don't see a lot of stuff about the, the, the rainforest. So is it really a big deal or is it just people that social media warriors are saying here, I, I want to have a cause and I want to fight for something. And I want to look like I care about society. So I'm going to share this link. And so that's the thing I thought was really interesting is you had someone like, uh, I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio posted the rainforest is burning. And then he, you know, pledged a bunch of money to go help, you know, the military in Brazil fight the fires. And there's news coming out that they're actually deploying people to go fight the fires. They're, they have C-130 jets dropping thousands of liters of water over parts of the forest that are burning that seem to be rogue burns um, that, you know, we don't know who started. And it seems to be illegal burning. Um, so Bolsonaro's. Um, presidency. He did initiate the military. And so then the argument becomes, was it because of this influence of social media Mm -hmm. or because he actually has a 
um, hmm. a policy, you know, that he's implementing or enforcing. So now I don't he, know. So he may just be doing it because of the pressure, right? Because now there are Got presidents it. talking about it. The French president, you know, is talking about how ba- bad it is in Brazil, and everyone's getting involved and it's bandwagoning. Because there's social media pressure when you have large groups of, you know, again, the social media warriors, people that are that are actively looking at this cause and saying this is the most important thing. Look at the lungs of the world; they're burning. Twenty percent of our oxygen is produced by the Amazon. Don't you care? And then now we have, you know, the news, which I don't think a month ago was really talking about it. Again, like if you look just a couple of weeks, people really weren't talking about this on social yeah. media. It's just in the last week or so that it's really picked up. Now there are lots of articles coming out about what is happening in the Amazon. And it didn't happen until people started talking about it on social media. At least it seems that way. It could have happened coincidentally at the same time. They both started talking about it. But it looks like the news coverage is a direct response to the, to the actual so people you, out crying. So your initial question was, do we drive the media or does, does media drive culture? And what you're saying from that, it seems like the news said, well, look, our job is to make money by giving mm-hmm. people what they want. And this seems to be what people are talking about. So now let's all kind of focus on that. Yep. So you would say that media picks up what culture is. I think it's a mirror. Ha. Huh. You think media is a culture uh, is um yeah, the th- mirror of culture, not culture. I think I think in a lot of ways the the news actually mirrors what the culture wants to talk about, right? Because they want to make money and profit. So if people want to talk about a thing, they're going to make news articles about a thing. That's interesting. I did see a study where they talked about like news stories online and they, they asked people, what stories would you be interested in seeing? And people said, well, I'm interested in seeing these news stories uh, about international stuff, about financial things, about, you know, I want to see all of these high level intellectual news stories. But when we came down to actually going in and, and looking at what they clicked on, it was all stories about, oh, this person's having this person's baby and this person's breaking up. And look, they had <laughs> eggs for breakfast. Yeah. You know, so yeah. like it's what it's, we say and what we do aren't the same. Right, things. not the same thing. What do you think, Tobin? Well, I think it's a. I think media and culture are a feedback loop, uh, too, because the more the media talks about something, the more people will talk about it as well. I'm not sure that the media is a direct reflection. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it creates the trends, and senses when it's time for the new trend. But that might be a chicken and egg question. They they definitely are a feedback loop. It's like the um like the it was the guy on on YouTube a few years ago who showed a dead body on his channel, and mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. and YouTube uh, cracked down on him a little bit, and then all the other YouTubers were ta- made videos talking about how bad it was that this person had shown a dead body on his channel, and so he continued to be a top search result because everyone was talking about how wrong how wrong it was, what he had done. And so instead of him doing something wrong and going away for it. Now 4 million people are talking about Everyone was talking about him, and that's all that matters is what people are talking about, not what they're saying. Logan Paul was the 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 guy, yeah. Yeah. And I I only discussed, he's not a YouTuber I even know. I know him because people I know were posting about him. Yeah. So, Tobin, when Chris was talking, I had a hard time following him some because he used social media and the word media, I think meaning the press, almost to me, they're synonymous and you are differentiating between them. Were you following his line of talk there? Do you, in other words, well, you guys I mean, are younger than me. Do you use the words differently than I do? Well, the, 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 the proliferation of angry, poorly thought out media articles <laughs> being posted by my friends on social media is why I'm not in social media anymore. Um, I, I feel like I feel like me, the media, the print media, or I guess it's online media now, is uh, has filled up so much of social media. So you distinguish between between um, commercial mainstream media and social media. I do, but I think commercial media is trying its best to take over social media. Don't you think the other way around is also happening? So in other words, I'll give you an example. Glenn Beck may be an anchor on Fox News, but Glenn Beck has his own has social his own media social channel. Media. Yeah. Is it all Glenn Beck or is one more commercial than the other? Well, certainly the way that we consume it, it's all one thing. Yeah. So, so back to your yeah. point about this feedback loop. I, to me, it's all the same person, but maybe it's because I'm old. So, so the, differentiate it for so me. So here's the distinguishing factor I'm making. Um, I have people I know on Instagram that have 20 followers. They don't have a lot of attention, but it was significant enough to them that they wanted to post a thing about it. So that's how I saw it. It wasn't because Glenn Beck posted it. It wasn't because Joe Rogan posted it. Because these people that, you know, don't have any followings on social media, they're the ones posting about it. Now, are they posting links to mainstream media things? Possibly. That might be where they're linking to. 
But my point is I'm not hearing about it from those, those channels, those feeds. I'm hearing about it from individuals. Oh, so, so I only get the channel, so well, I'm, I'm getting it from them, not the individuals. Yeah. So, okay, so every morning I, I run on my elliptical, which always makes me feel like uh, like I'm doing something healthy for myself. But I also feel like a wuss because my neighbor across the, the road is a, a, a Green Beret. And so every day he comes out and he gets in his car and he goes out to you know train to be one of the toughest guys on the planet. And he sees me on my garage and my elliptical, right? But every morning when I'm doing this, I'm watching ESPN. And ESPN this morning, 90% of the coverage I saw was just them discussing tweets and Instagram posts by people. So, like, even the main news channels are just rehashing what the social media posts are. And they're just discussing it. That's true. So I feel like there's a big inner intersection, big gray area where they all cross over and they're all the same sort of thing. Well, it's not not that reality television and that social media are the same thing, but we do now have a reality television star in the White House. So that's that's a kind of a weird crossover yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, my generation would have said the same thing about Ronald Reagan, though, right? That we actually and then when Schwarzenegger was governor, we would say, how are these celebrities becoming presidents? Mm-hmm. I Do you feel, think it's different? I think, well, it's different, at least in degree, because the media, which the media, which Schwarzenegger and um, Reagan were a part of was more artfully crafted and had more of a point. And reality television really, I think, just feeds on people's need to be staring at a screen and at their at their ability to switch their brains. Off. Well, so you okay. think Bedtime there... for Bonzo was a well-crafted movie. That's what Reagan was in. I think he I think he, he it took more craftsmanship to make a film back then because we didn't all there was fewer there was fewer me or there was less media. To take up your attention. Now you can just point a camera at something and call it a television show. And that's basically what reality TV is. Well, I don't know if we can blame these people. First of all, let's say that uh, not Bonzo, but Newt Rockney was actually Reagan's best movie. But first of all, I, I think that the problem is maybe with us. I can't fault these people for using their platform. No, to advance I. themselves and whatever that platform is, however they achieved it, whether by you know, being a, a bodybuilding champion by being an actor, by walking on the moon, whatever it would be, you know, they right. say, well, this is my platform. I mean, that's just being an opportunist. I don't fault them. I fault the voters. Yeah. Because and that's why you've walked away. That's what I've pretty much walked away. And that's why right. when I call Trump a reality television star. I think that's the way in which he campaigned, too. Um, sure. Sch- Schwarzenegger and, and Reagan had certain beliefs about fiscal conservatism that they talked about, and people voted for those beliefs. That's Everyone true. liked that Trump said funny, rude things to yeah. people that they hated. That's big that, difference. That, that was a large <laughs> segment of his votership. Yeah, and then, you know, Obama's <laughs> really true. the initiator of all that, correct? He's the one that actually used the media first in that way, maybe yep. not as crassly, but he was the one that put, yeah. had messages in video games that they sold to children. But, but again, it, it was the rise of the era. We're talking about mm-hmm. the the advent of the internet as we oh, know it yeah, today. I mean, that was 2006 to 2000, mm-hmm. like on. Like 2006, I think, was when YouTube was created. This isn't and it an, changed the game. This isn't an anti-Trump statement coming from me. This, yeah. is a, this is a statement of my cynicism about the era in yeah. which he right. ran for president. Exactly. And, and that was what I was pointing out. It, wasn't, yeah. it didn't yeah, start with you. Obama necessarily because of Obama. It was just because that mm-hmm. was what was happening. That's and anyone right. else in that tool. time would have done it as well. Yeah. It's the platform yeah. you talked about. Sure. They're just using the platform that's given to them. Yeah. Right. So just to, to know for my generation, that was odd that celebrities were running for office yeah. because it, it didn't really happen. To, um, well, maybe on the local level. Another one that was really big with, at that time was, um, oh, Sonny and Cher. Sonny Bono was a senator for a while. So there was like just this rise of celebrity ship going into um, uh, leadership on the political side. And so we've seen that now politicians are celebrities. So it's come – it's become synonymous. It kind of has. I, I mean, how can you – wasn't George Washington a celebrity after he unified the 13 colonies and won a war? Sure. <laughs> like, I'm sure I, that is true. There's There are – maybe it's just hard for us to swallow that the movers and shakers of our world are, are now entertainers. Or maybe they have to be to be the mover and maybe. shaker. Because uh, you got to capture eyeballs. Well, and there's this whole uh, thesis out there that a lot of uh, psychologists are putting out that if you're even not just a politician, but also CEO of a major company, that you've, you're have you a psychopath who's managed to control your worst tendencies, I mean, that you have to have that kind of just odd desire to be in front of everybody in hmm. order to reach that level of 
uh, power. That's interesting. I was talking with a buddy of mine this last week who was talking about on narcissism scales. They say that the average person is like 11 or below. They say Trump is like an, an 80 something and they have um, they say that uh, the normal leader CEO is like a 30 or below. And they say the normal CEO has to have a certain level of narcissism in order to be a leader and to convince people to follow them. So, yeah, there is. I think there's an element of that. Yeah. You could call that self-assuredness. Sure, confidence. I mean, Mm -hmm. when I see football players say, oh, hey, I'm the best in the world. Nobody's faster than me. I can outrun your defense and catch a touchdown over you. I mean, you have boxers going into a fight going like, well, I mean, this guy's probably going to be Yeah, he's pretty good, man. I'm going to have to pull out all my stuff. You know, I mean, nobody does that. You have to have that level of confidence or else you're not going to achieve that success. So I get that. I can't fault that. No plan B. So now if you have a platform that's really large, ubiquitous all across the world, and you have that kind of confidence, all of a sudden you have followers who maybe weren't even interested in what you were interested in until you said it a certain way or had a certain graphic or a certain yeah. witticism. Yeah, I think the problem comes when we as Christians, we say, how do you reconcile that need for that self-confidence and self-assuredness with um, a desire to walk in biblical humility and follow in Jesus' footsteps in that manner? And I think that's where it becomes really tough to be a Christian celebrity. Yeah, I think it's there's a recognition in there that the humility will necessarily build your confidence. Um, you're, you're, you know, if you have the humility to listen to the lowest around you, then you're going to hear insights that you otherwise didn't have. And those will necessarily make you a better leader. Hmm. Like a, like a president saying, I'm going to keep members of the opposite party Yeah, to speak. In. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's going back to something you said, Jeremiah, about, um, maybe you have to, I, I don't know. It was it was something one of, one of you said. I feel like now we're we are very uh, the political sphere is very much an economy of rhetoric rather than an economy of um, beliefs or policies or values, and that's that's real. I think that's really where my emotions about Trump come in is not about him as a as a president or as maybe as a narcissist or or any any of these things, um, but that really. He won because he was so much better at saying rhetoric that appeals to non-thinkers than Hillary was. Hillary was out there trying to say some smart things, and nobody cares. I feel like let's back up because you're you're painting <laughs> you know? with a very you're painting with a very broad brush, and I think that could be possibly uh, condescending or offensive when you say it appeals to non-thinkers. Oh, so I'm basically, not saying when you're saying if you voted for who... him, you're not that you're a non-thinker. Okay. Obviously, there's a large uh, group of blue-collar workers who voted for him because the liberal party in our country no longer protects their hey, jobs. Hey, I voted for him, and I didn't there's, take offense from what he said. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's folks who maybe didn't like him, but liked him better than Hillary. And there's folks that probably liked him for, for his uh, economic policies as well. I'm saying, why did he stand out amongst the other Republican nom- nominees? Why is he all over the news? Is because he says things that people would rather share than think about. He he says some stupid things because he's a human being, but I feel like he's actually weaponized saying stupid things yeah, that I people agree. will share. I, I agree with that. Sound bites. He does a great job of speaking shareable sound bites. Of shareable yeah. sound bites that that don't have much value other than being shareable. I'm pointing to this as a vice that as something that should be a vice, but that he has turned into an engine of popularity. I'm right. not. I'm not saying people who voted yeah. for him are stupid. I think he says what people have been wanting to say, but don't want to say because they don't want to be, you know, super contentious to their friends on their social media. Maybe. So now I can just share this other guy saying it for me. Well, like maybe when, so. Like when I say, "Hey, uh, a buddy of mine has a bad rash. What should he do for it?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Asking or for a friend. My, a buddy of mine thinks you guys are a bunch of jerks. You hate the. <laughs> you hate America. I I'll share an insight. When I was in Russia last year, a professor who spent a lot of time teaching here looked at me and he said, why are there certain words that when you start to use them, you Americans whisper it? Who's listening to you that you think is going to get you in trouble? Hmm. And so I started thinking about it. I went, yeah, there are words I whisper because I'm, and they aren't, there are words I wouldn't have whispered 10 years ago because I didn't think anything of them. And now it's like I've been told, you know, like it's calling someone a fat person maybe. I mean, not like they're bad words as much as they're descriptive words we're not allowed to use anymore. I mean, some gender words started to feel that way. Like, am I allowed to say that? 
right? And who was this? And what was it? Was a Russian professor who was over here teaching Russian at a university for three years, and then I met him back in Russia. We were, so that's interesting. He said, "Why do you all whisper?" And I, and so this is funny because this is I think the communist culture makes them whisperers. And he's like, and then when I was there, that wasn't the case. They don't whisper; they say it. Right. And huh. so that's kind of I think also what what you're referring to. That he's saying that Trump says things people wish they could say. And maybe we're just politer or kinder or or maybe we're afraid. I don't know, you know, for each person in each situation why we do what we do. But Trump's not a whisperer and that's bothering people. So I, think, I think for any human mm-hmm. to exist and you know, succeed in business or society and, and wherever they are, you have to have a certain amount of tolerance for repressing your feelings and the things you want to say mm-hmm. and just going along with what's going on around you. Yeah, and you learn that as a child. Right. You don't want to stand out in the middle of the group and always be the kid that's contentious because no one will play with you. Right. And kindness and honesty are two sides of of a, of a, the same coin. Mm-hmm. Right. And so learning when that's just good manners to not always say what you yeah. want. Yeah. Bible says time. truth and love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you feel like he's popular. I tell you the opposite. <laughs> I think he's popular for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then again, so are all the responses to him like this, uh, like this whole thing. Um, that, you know, Trump says he's the second coming of God. Have you heard <laughs> this heard tweet? That one. Heard this tweet, which no, which no, he didn't. He said that the, and, the, and CNN, CNN is like, oh, he says he's, he's using this messianic language. Let us show you the clip. And then, <laughs> and then in the clip, he says, I've done these great things for the Jewish state. The Jewish state loves me. They love me so much. It's like they think I'm the second coming of God, which is an odd thing for 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 a Jew to think. But um, but but that's what Trump said. The Jewish state thinks, and then and CNN seemed to miss half of those words and think that Trump said it of himself. And what's frightening is that uh, the audience believes it because they're being told to by a reporter. It, like, oh, here's what this video says. Look at it yourself. Oh, yeah, it does say that. And I've seen I've seen people on the left and right do that to true. a frightening degree. The propagate misinformation mm-hmm. to actually change the way you receive the words. Yes. It's yeah. like that, when I hear, that is terrifying. Yeah, it's like when I hear a preacher go, in the original language, here's what he was actually saying, but it's doing it in real time. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's like a, here it is. In, in the English language of 2018, here's what Trump was really saying. Yes. Yeah. And I... I think I, I don't know. I don't know what my current response to to that trend is, as you know, to to walk away from politics. I don't know if that's going to be my final response, but it's a it's a scary thing. And the big big one was in Charlottesville, mm-hmm. um, but people oh, yeah, so misrepresented yeah. on all mm-hmm. sides. Mis- sure. And and I had I had uh, right wing friends who should have known better saying that here's what's happening in this video when it. Clearly, something else is happening. It's a video. How are you misinterpreting those? Well, and that's only going to get worse as technology keeps getting better. You guys have seen online, of course, where you can um, manipulate someone's face and mouth to say whatever you you want to sound. I don't think you need to. Well, that's a very optimistic view of how smart people are that they would ever need video manipulated for them. Oh, I totally disagree. I think I think when you look at uh, things just like you were saying about CNN, how easy would it be for someone to create a clip of Trump saying something totally different? Well, why well, don't he's right? agreeing with you. He's saying they don't even have to go that far. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's true. All they have to do is come on before it and tell you what he's going to say. Yeah. So do you guys yeah, remember in Challenge 2, for, uh, Schaefer's How Should We Now Live? And he shows two video clips of a scene between government and yeah, protesters. Yeah, and in one, it's the exact same scene, but it's different music with some hmm. different commentary, but the exact same image. And one's pro-government and the other one's pro-protesters. And, you know, so the point of that was to discuss how just because you see it, you still don't, if you don't have context, they can still manipulate you. Yeah. yeah. There's a documentary that just came out on Netflix and I haven't watched it. So I'm not going to talk about it too much, but essentially it seemed to be all about how social media is being used by these big corporations to control the way we think. And, you know, they're they're manipulating us in these subtle ways here and there. And I watched the trailer and it had like I felt like I was in the born identity and I was like (laughs) uncovering these secrets and like they were going to tell me how to perceive all these big corporations that want to control me. And I was like, wow, this is so manipulative. It's exactly what you're telling me they're doing. Right. And I love that even though you're too smart to to uh, be taken in by the ancient aliens type of documentary, maybe this one will appeal to you. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. 
funny. Yeah. Uh, well, so um, let's go ahead and segue from this Amazon article and influence to just the whole idea of just celebrity ship and Christian response to it. And so we had talked about referring to what happened with Josh Harris and oh, some other Christian celebrities over the last week. I thought, Jeremiah, could you maybe give us the background on... Um, what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, I Josh know. Harris. We'll start with Josh Harris. Uh, I grew up, my my mom started homeschooling in 85. I have two older brothers, so we were right in the middle of the Christian homeschool culture when Josh Harris became famous. As a teenager, pushing his book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, which basically said, look, everyone who's dating is doing it wrong. And the problem with society roots back to the problem people have dating. Marriages are failing because people, the, the foundation is wrong. So he was saying instead of dating, you should do something called courtship. And um, he's very charismatic. And he, my two older brothers actually went to see him speak one time. And they came back. And I think my parents did a pretty healthy job where they said uh, dating is not entirely bad, um, but this is not a full solution to it either. Um, you know, I, the courtship method still has its flaws as well. So what happened is a lot of people, um, a lot of people subscribe to Josh Harris's method by his dating by let's court instead of date. And it influenced especially the, the Christian homeschoolers, but also conservative Christians across the board. So years later, Wait, uh, I'm going to stop you there. Here's why. So Tobin months and months ago, before all this came out, with yeah. Josh Harris, you were telling me why you could not stand that book and the culture that was around it. So before we get yep. the follow up here, or could you tell us what you were thinking back then? Somebody summed up that book um, in a in a pretty good way, a way that I haven't been able to sum it up any better, is that you have a whole culture of people raising their kids not to make certain mistakes. And then that culture feeds their kids a book to make them even more afraid of making those mistakes that they wouldn't have made anyway from the way they were raised. And that was exactly my experience reading this book. I, I didn't have... I didn't have that conversation of uh, kind of just taking it as one guy's perspective. I was I was more gung ho into it, and um, it's it's a book that frankly made me afraid of my attractions to the opposite sex, and made me uh, put a lot of a lot of weight into uh, initiating a relationship. Like uh, you had like. You have to know that this is going to work or you will be injuring this person. Mm. And as a result, I injured that person by not acting on the amount of the, the amount of uh, relationship that we had, but instead expecting in, and uh, demanding that there be this this uh, that, that, you know, that, that the trajectory go all the way to the end because you've failed if it doesn't. And that's the um, that that was what it kind of taught me. And then I went to, as I kind of got over that, I went to a college where everyone else had read it too. And I can complain that it was hard to get a date there, but that's not an important complaint. The, the important observation was when you had a, had a whole college of folks that had read this book, it was, it was very, it was a paranoid atmosphere with regard to dating. Uh, you know, ask somebody out for coffee and you have to phone her dad and he's going to have this long end game plan with you and talk about where where is this headed it's not headed anywhere it's coffee <laughs> you know it's 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 where where it's and then then you get into weird discussions of well where it's headed is i think your daughter is physically attractive what what do you think is motivating this right. coffee date oh well that doesn't seem like a very christian motivation yeah because i don't know her the only level on which I'm interacting is visually because what else do I even have? What else is even going on between us? So what happened there is a lot of people experienced what you experienced. And there became this big backlash of mm -hmm. people who had hurt, damaged relationships and dating periods. I think and so. even through that, got themselves in relationships that they maybe shouldn't have got themselves into because they moved too quickly, too fast because they took it too seriously. They had to. Yeah. Right. Okay. They felt like they needed to. So slow so. down with a little bit of context and then we're going to go. Yeah, so how, I have a totally different viewpoint on all of this, that things come in cycles and your parents were raising you from the sex, drug, and rock and roll era where it was so promiscuous. 
And then here is a tool that helped them go, yeah, there's some things we could have done better. So the one thing I want to caution you in is that all relationships are rocky at first and nobody's going to get it right in any generation, in any culture. Two broken people trying to figure something out who have family associated with them, it's just going to be hard, guys. So I don't want to throw that book away. I still want people to read it. I just want them to read it with some sensibility and common sense behind them and know it's it's an explanation of an option. By a 19-year-old. Well, well, it was okay, influenced by his parents up. a whole lot. It was influenced the by Harris's his parents. The Harris's amazing people. Yeah, and he wrote a follow-up called Boy Meets Girl as well. And then here's let's go ahead and provide the rest of the story for Josh yes, Harris Yes, now here. go ahead and finish. Okay, so after he wrote these two books, he has this kind of very—he uh, was a celebrity status within an admittedly small pocket of people. Okay, people outside that pocket had no idea who he was. People inside that pocket, he was right below Jesus Christ. Yep. So then he beca- he gets um, on staff at a church uh, in Maryland, and that person, uh, the lead pastor, there are a lot of scandals and things like that. Some abuse charges that come against the church. Lead pastor steps away. He steps in as a senior pastor role. At this point, he's had no formal pastoral training or education. Okay, so we all provide the context. He steps away from being senior pastor some years ago, decides, well, I'm going to go get my seminary degree, goes and pursues his ministry uh, theology, you know, d- d- delve more into that, okay? At this point, he starts hearing a lot of backlash from people who had similar experiences to Tobin and many worse. And he says, wait a minute, maybe I was wrong, because now I have the context of, you know, 15 more years under my belt, being married for some time, having some kids, seeing it through their eyes, seeing some of the mistakes. Maybe I was wrong. So then he came out, and this was an admirable thing to do, uh, and produced a documentary interviewing some of these people and saying, I was wrong. Tell me your story. How did I affect you? And he came out with some very public apologies. Okay, which brought him back into the limelight again. Celebrity. So now he's celebrity. He's famous again because all these people have rehashed it. They're nostalgic. They're remembering back from they were a kid. They had started to push on their own kids. They brought he's so he's back second generation of popularity. Okay, so then um, just recently he comes out and he says, look, I, I am renouncing my Christian faith. Um, I apologize to the, the LGBTQ community. I think I got got all this. I think I got them all. Um, I apologize to this community. I was wrong. Um, You know, one love. Jesus loves everybody. And by the way, I'm getting divorced as well. So there's all of this stuff happens. And this was earth shattering for so many Christians. That's the context. And I'll step away for a moment. All right, Tobin. Because my question is, why? I have neighbors in much more pain than he is. Why Why do I care about this celebrity in the sense that we're caring about him? I care about him because he is a brother in Christ. Yeah. But, I mean, the level of the care, right, compared Mm. to a neighbor I can actually touch and help Mm. is my concern. And so it's a distraction. Mm. Oh, I'm I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I wish you would say it. (laughs) Yes. Why, why is this a surprise? It, yeah. It's Sovereign Grace Ministries. So you're saying, <laughs> uh, okay. It's in, the, it's in the process of collapse, and it has been for a very long time. Oh, no, their senior pastor walked away from the faith? Well, how is this a shock? Oh, see, I know nothing and, about the ministry. So you see how that's kind of a cynical and mean thing to say. I see. But, so you're saying, but the whole culture up there is struggling right now. Well, yes. I mean— I don't I don't know if that's all of it, though. I mean, I agree that certainly played a part. And there were years of hurt that he went through as part of that ministry in between writing the, the second book and coming out with the documentary. So he had a lot of baggage that he carried into that period and a lot of stuff that he uh, endured during that period, which certainly was not was, would, would have been very difficult for anyone to do in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. So I understand that. But I think the problem would be more with the whole concept of celebrity and the weight that that carries than it does. Because I think if you enter that in a healthy perspective, then you can maybe navigate those waters better than he did and come out on the other side closer to Christ than running away from him. Hmm. Here's – I okay, I think – I think the problem is more with with celebrity cultures because when when you're a when you're um, let me think about this Drew Pinsky do you guys know who Dr Drew is you ever heard okay he used to he's kind of a um, celebrity psych- psychologist yeah to the stars basically in Hollywood yeah he I first learned about him back years ago in the 90s he hosted a radio show called Love Line which I 
uh, would have difficulty uh, recommending to anybody back in the day. But I listened to him, and, and he wrote a book a few years ago called The Mirror Effect, where he talks about the law of reflection and how basically there's models and there's mirrors, and everyone's modeling something and everyone's mirroring something. So he says that the problem today in society is we have a celebrity culture that models sickness, and then we have a culture that mirrors it. So we look at celebrities and we look at the way they're acting and we say, well, I want to be like that person. So he says the problem with celebrity is two things. He said, one, personally, is the more popular you are, the more pressure you have to perform. Hmm. And that leads to more outlandish and destructive behavior. Now, he says the other problem with, with, with celebrity is socially, the more exposure you have, the more validity you have over your lifestyle, which leads to more people imitating you. So I think, you know, this, okay, like uh, football season's coming up, right? Uh, You can tell this is my third football reference of the show. So you can tell I'm excited about this. Yeah. Newton's injured, but he's got Will Greer as a great backup. West Virginia boy. I'm excited about it. (laughs) So, uh, but when, okay, so what happens every football season? You see a streaker run on the field, right? Why does the TV camera cut away? Because they don't want people mirroring that behavior that guy's modeling. So they want to give as little exposure as possible. Because the first time it happened, they did give it a lot of exposure. And everyone's laughing about it. And then what happens is we have a sick culture that says, well, look, I want to I want to mirror what that person modeling. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the problem is it's very difficult to be a Christian celebrity because there's nothing exciting about watching somebody live a biblically Christian lifestyle. You don't watch a TV show to see someone repent of their sins, read their Bible and walk their dog. That's not a good TV show, right? So in order to be a Christian, if you had someone who um, committed sins, hit people with their Bible and ate their dog, I'd watch that on TV. That's a TV show I would see. But you don't have that. So you have these celebrities who say, look, in order to maintain my status and the validity that I think people are giving me, then I have to continually do things that will put me in the spotlight. Mm, I feel like that's even more cynical than my my (laughs) viewpoint. That's – you might be right. (laughs) Do So – that goes to um, what, what is it? What the the skillet guy, uh, John Cooper. John Cooper, Cooper uh, was so was going off on on Josh Harris and on some of these others, saying if you're leaving the faith, fine. Why does that? Why do you have to hold on to the limelight? Why do you have to encourage people to leave the faith with you with your wording? I don't I don't know if he was saying specifically Harris did that, but. Um, you're this, you're this influencer. Why do you want to continue to be an influencer in the community, the Christian community? Especially in when the you've way been saying you you've been wrong all these years. Well, maybe right. you're still wrong. Aren't you embarrassed? Don't, don't you just want to leave? Why wouldn't you, wouldn't you say this as this is, this is my choice. Don't, don't follow me because you still have a good thing going. Why, why is that none of, the, none of the attitude? I didn't say it as well as, as well. Yeah. I thought, and I think Cooper did a good job. Well, Plato says you can tell the morals and the values of any culture by the songs that they sing or their entertainment. Right. Yeah. And Cooper's coming from that entertainment perspective. So now, now here, I think McLuhan, who Marshall McLuhan was a communication theorist back in the fifties. He took Plato's, uh, what he said to the next level and said, look, it's, it's not just that you can tell the morals and the values of the culture by the entertainment that they're communicating, but the way that they communicate those songs and the way that they engage in that entertainment. So here, I think what Cooper was saying was, look, we're not content to just question or change our beliefs. We would rather clearly elevate our celebrity status above all else because we want to communicate those beliefs to the world and we want to announce that publicly. And I think, I think that validates what McLuhan said because the way that he wants to communicate his change in beliefs and that shift says far more than the actual content of, of his statement itself. Is, is this entertainment, you think? Well, did it catch current event? news? And it's current event? Absolutely. Current events? I mean, we have, we have magazines at the grocery store that are the, from the colors used and the layout on the cover are very clearly meant to be entertainment, but they are stories about real things that are happening. Well, usually, you, and they're blowing up. I mean, yeah. one celebrity is a Christian. It was like uh, the just amazing headline on the magazine, and then you open it up, and it turned out she had like a distant relative that was divorced at one point, <laughs> and that was the big headline. That's the big scandal. Yeah. So, it's it's just a weird place to be. Hmm. Hmm. I I just feel like we we elevate the celebrity status and we we crave the tweets and that's that focus on self is I think the big problem here. Um so I would I think John Cooper had a really good point when he said, "Look, if you really are questioning your beliefs, why don't you do it privately instead of saying um and I and here 
I don't agree with everything that Cooper said. He he said one thing um, in that same post, and and let's be fair, he wasn't. Cooper was not just referring to Harris. He was actually referring to Marty Sampson, who's a popular songwriter for Hillsong United, I believe, um, out in Australia. Mm-hmm. And Marty Sampson had a, a, a post where he said, "Look, I am." Um, it was an interesting back and back and forth. He said, "I'm I'm questioning my faith." Yeah. Is basically what Marty Sampson said. Then Cooper comes out and says, well, why in the world would you be doing this publicly? What's wrong with you? You know, shouldn't you be doing this privately? You're just doing it for the attention. And then Marty Sampson says, well, no, I was just trying to be honest. But then in a subsequent post, brags about having over, you know, how many Instagram followers he has. So something's off with Sampson there. But I, I didn't agree with uh, everything that Cooper said because the other thing that he mentioned was about worship artists and how their job is not necessarily to communicate truth, but to create an atmosphere emotionally where people are ready to um, are ready to engage and listen to the message. So I totally disagree with Cooper hmm, on that part. That's a scary part. thought. That's a scary thought, yeah, because I think that, you know— um, it's, it's Colossians 3, uh, where Paul says, look, you use psalms and you use hymns and you use spiritual songs to, um, to teach and to admonish each other. So I think they go hand in hand. Um, but I, I do think that Cooper's uh, presentation about um, how the platform that you're using to speak about these doubts is something you need to consider. Hmm. Can we talk about how we um, – I'm just looking at time. So Chris brought up from the very beginning about – they talk about Amazon and no one's talking about it. And then the next articles were talking about Amazon and no one's talking about it. And then we've come full circle with influencers that are Christians and celebrities. And I just listened to you mention Plato, Marshall McEwen, the guy, and then three celebrities right now. So we're saying how social media and celebrity ship and popularity might not be the best thing, but we don't know how to speak to each other without referring to real people it's who've so done true. real things. So it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Or how do we separate when it becomes a bad thing versus a good thing? Exactly. You should never talk about an author that's alive. Yeah, uh, that's that's, a, that's well, a there's there's something very man. true with that. Like you can't name your kid after O.J. Simpson or Bill Cosby. You thought they were safe, and then they go off the deep end, right? Exactly. So you have to wait till they die. That's funny. no. I think 100 percent the problem. Um, we are discussing it around a table with each other face to face. I think that's the way these discussions were meant to have. That's why we build CC around communities, because we think technology divides us in and puts, pushes us into, into isolation. You know, for years, that's the way information is communicated in oral society. We memorize scriptures, we speak truths because we gather around, we recite them together, we commit them to memory. So then you have the written language comes along, and all of a sudden people are writing these ideas in isolation without as much accountability. I can create and you can consume in isolation. So you don't have the accountability that comes with different, you know, this this kind of discussion. Okay. So yes, we're referencing other people, but we're having it in a conversation. Now the internet just exacerbates that because now you have these people who can not only create, but they can publish publicly this information without this accountability. So I think the problem is not that we're referencing these celebrities. I think the problem is when um, you don't have a tribe of elders or a council of people that you can discuss it with to keep you accountable. Hmm. And that may be what happened with Josh Harris here. Could be. Where he didn't have a community to to say, look, let's keep you accountable with these questions. It's okay to question Marty Sampson. It's okay to have these doubts, but you have to have people who speak into you and say, look, let's, as, as all through history, you know, Christian, you know, the elders would gather together and say, look, this does not line up with the doctrine we believe. So. And then they have to live with each other. Right. Hmm. So you're saying celebrities, what, what, I feel like you're, you're taking that into ecclesiology now and we were, but I think you were making a point about uh, being a cultural influencer, though, I I do. I how think does, how does the council idea apply to being a cultural? Influencer? Okay, here's the thing. I think our ability to instantly produce and publish content without accountability does two things. I think it weakens and even destroys tribal bonds, mm. and I think it it amplifies the value of the individual over the value the individual is supposed to have. Well, it. it oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm not saying that we should become luddites, and maybe that is what I'm saying. If you, okay, here's the thing. <laughs> totally if you, saying. yeah, here's if you, okay, let me back up. If you live in your parents' basement, you haven't showered in two weeks, and all you do is play World of Warcraft, I would say yes. You need to be shut off your computer. Go take a shower. Go outside. See the sun, and talk to a real live girl. 
You know, <laughs> but for most people, I, I, I think the issue is not in embracing culture or technology. I think the issue is embracing it unconsciously. That's yeah. I don't think we we can't become Luddites um, because then we're not preaching we're not preaching the gospel in all tongues to all men. But we have to. I think every kind of every quantum leap in information sharing, you know, paper, the printing press, the internet, a uh, television, I guess, was one of them. Sure, uh, right. all of those bring a bring a the possibility for unqualified people. To put their ideas before the public, and the internet is the, the is, is the most intense one that has happened. And what you have to do is is not to. Re- I don't think I don't think it's, it's right to reject it or to distance. Maybe it's right for some people to distance themselves from it. There are some people who like shouldn't be on Facebook, probably. <laughs> but uh, uh, but what what I think you do have to do is to put it in it into its correct place. I 100% agree with that. Construct a, make it a small part or a, just a, just a moderate part of a big life rather than making it your life. Yeah. And I think Andy Crouch, I think um, Tim Challies, I think there are a lot of good books out now because we've had the internet long enough where the studies have come along to show how to do it in a healthy way. Um, I think they, they do good things. I think the problem with Harris and with Samson and with these, these other people and, um, the repercussions that always kind of ripple across um, that the Christian community when you have one of these Christian celebrities stumble or fall or even just question honestly, mm-hmm. um, I think the problem is we we are trying to mirror what they're modeling instead of what Christ does. You know what Ephesians five, Paul says, follow God's example. You know, so if we're, we're to be Christ imitators. You know, obviously Jesus is the one who said even Jesus was a mirror. He said, yeah. um, you know, he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, <laughs> right? Um, and then Paul tells the Corinthian church, he says, um, I, I want you to, to imitate me just like I'm imitating Jesus. So I think the, the problem is when we start elevating Christian leaders and saying, look, they have charisma, so I'm going to equate that with character. And I'm going to say mm-hmm. that because of their presentation, I'm going to say that's doctrine. I'm going to follow. We have to recognize that following a pastor's way of following Jesus is not the same as following Jesus. So the, the God is the model, and we should be mirrors of him. And I think we can all look at not just Harris, but there are a lot of churches that we can say, this is a very popular church, a very popular preacher who's extremely charismatic, and ask the question, what would happen to that church if that pastor fell? You know, I think Mars Hill up in Seattle is a good example of that. It's, People elevated him into celebrity yeah. status. Things happened with him, and the whole church had the had the you know eleven thousand people. They couldn't even divide into their own churches. And I know people who even even outside of those churches, I know people who could then go and throw away the books written by that man, which is seems like an overreaction to me. I'll tell you, the first thing I did when Driscoll, when the whole thing happened with Mark Driscoll, um, is all of his books went on sale, and I went and bought each one huh. because the problem was never with his doctrine. The problems with other things regarding his leadership, yeah. right? But so we can't. We're not. It's not easy to separate our personalities. Sure. From the truth. I, mean, I think that's what that indicates is this person has let me down, and I must throw away all his books. I feel like maybe that person mm-hmm. was a bigger part of your life than mm-hmm. than he should have been. Yeah, that you made that person your model instead. Of, you're trying to mirror them instead of instead of God. I had somebody at a conference. A woman asked me why I promoted Dorothy Lee Sayer so much when she had a child out of wedlock, yeah. and I just immediately looked at her and said, "Well, then nobody here should listen to me because I can start listing my sins." Yeah, yeah. you need mm-hmm. to separate the biblical truth of homeschooling and education and the parent-child relationship from anything I say. And if I hit it right, great, <laughs> follow it. And le- but otherwise, go. Yeah, she's just another sinner trying to figure it out like I am. So that's the beauty of the communities that we have with CC is because you can say what Lee said does not work for me. What's working for you? And ask the other people in your community. And that's where this face-to-face dialogue you can have with each other, um, that's where this can really help. Now, people don't always have that luxury, which is why we have tools like CC Connected, where people can get on, because there is value in that as long as you're having it, you know, you're engaging in that discussion with people. And I want to end there because I want to end with this idea. Thanks, guys. That was a great conversation. But this is the first week back for a lot of the Classical Conversations communities. And all of you tutors and and, um, uh, state representatives and local representatives and our trainers and our practicum hosts and you mothers and fathers, you are your children and your community's best influencers. And you are far more powerful than anybody that 
your community hasn't met. Please touch those around you, dine with those around you, uh, t- discuss books with those around you, and make sure everybody just really enjoys showing up on their community day knowing that no matter how much we fail every day, his mercies are new the following, and we're just there to encourage one another. So thank you guys, and we're off. 